No Game No Life Season 2 never happened. But that doesn't mean the story ends there. This is why I read the books, and I'm here to summarize what happens next. Now it has been 9 long years, so here's a brief refresher. Siblings get isekai'd, easily become king, talked with a god, enslaved a warmongering angel, befriended an elf, reclaimed humanity's territory, and formed an alliance with the werebeasts. Then technically, the anime ended with this epic scene, but that didn't happen in the book, so just forget about it. Then with volumes 1 through 3 making up season 1, we'll pick up the story with No Game No Life, volume 4. Now, oddly enough, this book begins with an unknown girl reading a fairy tale. It's about a princess who is receiving gifts from potential suitors. Eventually, a sketchy man brings a unique gift, causing our unknown girl to slam the book shut and fall into a deep sleep awaiting her prince's arrival. It's the middle of the night and everyone's asleep as a young man retreats into the corner with his tablet and a box of tissues. Awoken, Shiro states he could at least be quiet about it, followed by Izuna entering the room. Jibro appears, asking if there's a problem, just as everyone notices a creature appear out of the darkness. It's an Exceed Rank 12, Dampir, which looks uncannily like a vampire. FYI, sometimes there's not an official character model, so I have to improvise. She, however, collapses from exhaustion, and you come to find out most races believed they went extinct. You see, due to the commandments preventing violence, Dampir must have consent in order to drink blood, which is the bodily fluid with the highest concentration of soul. Being bitten, however, infects you with a disease, so of course Sora denies this vampire's plea for help. Apparently, the next best bodily fluid for them to consume is semen. Teleporting across the room, Sora gently lays the damsel down, realizing her to be a succubus. Shiro proclaims mature content isn't allowed, as Sora curses the presence of minors in this room. This act, however, is vital, even akin to CPR, as it would be immoral to let this sweet, innocent girl die. Pointing out saliva probably works as well, Shiro moves in to administer, but Sora prevents this, telling Jibril to kiss her instead. Apparently, a flugel's soul is too potent and would vaporize a dampier, so they resort to offering her a sweaty foot as a meal. Even Sora is bothered upon witnessing this, though Jibril states his and Shiro's souls are enticingly unique for this world. With the meal complete, Plum introduces herself and pleads for Amenity's rulers to come save the Dampier. Taking a brief moment to think about all the mature content this would surely entail, Sora tells her to screw off. That same evening, the Shrine Maiden is pondering Blank's lofty goal of gathering the 16 races to take on Tet. At one point in time, she actually held the same dream, but has long since given up. But she's begun hoping that Sora and Shiro may just be able to pull it off. Over in the kingdom of Elkia, an exhausted Steph faces off against a table of nobles. After reclaiming Amanity's lost territory, Sora ordered her to return home, along with Eno, to begin managing it. The nobles have been constantly challenging her for this land, which has prevented her from sleeping. Steph declares she's all in, causing these spineless nobles to fold. After they're gone, she screams the nobles are useless, and Eno points out they're at least easy to control. The original plan was for Eno to help Steph win, but they quickly realize she's learned so much from battling Blank that none of the nobles ever stood a chance. Steph then has an epiphany. She could just get rid of the nobility and rule this land as a dictator. Though suddenly she spots a glimpse of Sora and leaps into his arms, smashing face first into the wall. Eno then politely carries Steph off to bed, as she mumbles that Sora and Shiro are probably just goofing off. Back in the Eastern Union, Blank is petting a line of werebeast girls while playing yet another game against the Shrine Maiden. They ask what is love before announcing their umpteenth victory. The Shrine Maiden is curious how they cheated, but they didn't. Shiro just memorized all the pieces while Sora guessed what she would do. They won three demands with this victory, first of which is that the Shrine Maiden is to set up fair trade between Amanity and the Werebeasts. Their second demand is the same as many times before, and she reluctantly allows them to pet her tail, just barely managing to hold in her enjoyment. Moving on to the third demand, they explain that a certain Dampier was rejected, and as payback, spread the word of their petting skills all across the Eastern Union. Plum declares her race is at stake here, followed by the Shrine Maiden ordering the Werebeast to leave Sora and Shiro alone. Once they're gone, Sora brings up the city of Oceand, which is located under the sea, and is home to exceed rank 15, Siren, which are known to be the dumbest race. 
You see, after Sora rejected Plum's offer, she revealed that her race will likely go extinct without them. Knowing they need all the race pieces to challenge Tet, they prompt her to explain. Plum's eyes glow of magic as Jibro and Izuna jump in front of them to defend. Dampier specialize in illusion magic, though Plum was only deactivating a spell on herself. It's explained that sirens are only women who reproduce using men from other races. Sora wonders why they're not visiting Siren right now, and Jibro explains that men don't survive the encounter due to all their soul being sucked out. Jibro, growing ever more excited, reveals that a Dampier's bite causes sunlight to become deadly to you. However, Siren live at the bottom of the ocean. So Dampier came up with an idea. Siren will give them blood to drink, and in return, they'll trick males from other races into sleeping with the Sirens. Though somehow, the superior Dampier lost to the dumbest race. So now their males can only drink blood from Siren, and must even help them reproduce. Assuming correctly, Sora states that Dampier set up a game to be a draw. But Siren was too stupid to realize and ended up winning. Even after all this, both races still manage to survive, because each generation has one Siren who can actually reproduce without murder. Sora and Shiro are genuinely impressed, until Jibriel speaks up again. The current queen decided she'd wait for a prince, and has been sleeping in a magical slumber for the past 800 years. Due to this, the Dampier males can no longer reject the other Sirens, which has caused them to all die out, except for a single young boy. However, using magic, they can play a game versus the queen, where you try and win her love with the objective of causing her to wake up. If you're successful, you win 30% of Oceane's resources, and Plum even offers herself up as well. Now Blank is a master of romance games, but they immediately refuse. The Shrine Maiden is shocked they declined, prompting Blank to announce there's only two games they don't play, real life and real romance. They once again ask the Shrine Maiden to define love, but it turns out she's never really thought about it. Desperately, Plum exclaims she has a foolproof plan since the Dampier recently invented a love spell. Sora volunteers himself as a test subject, but Shiro doesn't let him. Immediately picking up on the reason why, the Shrine Maiden steps up instead. There's a flash of red magic, and Plum tells him the spell will activate upon squeezing her chest. With a nod of consent and a single squeeze, Miss Shrine Maiden's expression changes as she suddenly feels drawn to Sora's disgusting face. He thinks the spell must have failed, but Plum wants him to say something vulgar. After his declaration, the Shrine Maiden's face shows utter disgust, but she admits to loving him even more now. Plum proudly states that's just what love is for her, and Sora pleads for it to be turned off. Miss Shrine Maiden is very pleased with that experience, though the group wonders why Dampier didn't use this to win for themselves. That's because the spell requires a realistic pairing, and the last Dampier boy is too young to even reproduce. After briefly reading something on Shiro's phone, Sora proclaims he doesn't want to use the cheat spell if it can be avoided. Miss Shrine Maiden finds that amusing, and Blank admits they use tricks, but never outright cheat. They wish for the Shrine Maiden to join them in this game, and ask if she knows anyone who'd be useful. It's then revealed that Eno has taken 30 different wives throughout his years. An explosion rocks the castle, hurling stuff from her bed. Sora immediately insults Eno's promiscuity, followed by Izuna calling him a playboy. He lowers his head to the Shrine Maiden, as she orders Eno to accompany them to Oceand, as his Riz will be needed. Sora then compliments Steph, who's feeling a mixture of happiness and anger. Miss Shrine Maiden says that Eno has done a good job here, but Sora rejects this, declaring Steph to be the reason Elkia is in peak condition. They were 100% confident Steph wouldn't lose to any of the nobles, though she's scolded for accepting too many games and not resting properly, though he genuinely thanks her for the job well done. She thought they wanted her to work that hard, but Sora steps closer, causing her to go quiet. He thoroughly explains why they need to go to Oceand, and she realizes they were working just as hard as her this whole time. Sora then asks her to sew everyone a new swimsuit. Laying on the beach, with a group of animal girls fanning him, Sora complains that someone is only wearing a loincloth. The adorable Izuna appears first in a school swimsuit, followed by Sora freezing up upon witnessing Steph's bikini. Though a moment later, Jibro and the Shrine Maiden arrive, causing Sora and Eno to praise whichever deity created them. Now sunlight is deadly to Dampiers, so Plum is currently hiding inside a box using magic to shield herself. She complains they're here way too early, but Sora wasn't about to miss this chance to see the ladies in swimsuits. 
Now our damp here would be able to come out of the box if she got another meal, but that idea is instantly rejected. It's explained that a Dampir's strength depends on which race they drink blood from, followed by Sora wondering why Flugel is so much stronger than Elf when they're only one rank apart. Apparently, ranks 16 through 7 are known as living things and are primarily physical creatures, while on the other hand, ranks 6 through 1 are known as living beings and are primarily magical entities. On top of this, the power scaling gets even greater, as it would take 6 Flugel to safely take down a single gigant. Everyone is then stunned, as the unbelievably cute Shiro finally makes her appearance. With that, Sora, Shiro, Izuna, and Steph play a game, though while that's happening, Jibril nimbly removes the Shrine Maiden's top before being chased off into the horizon. Their otherworldly physical abilities cause a tidal wave to sweep over everyone, and you learn that Steph is the only person here who knows how to swim. A few moments later, Steph is so happy to just relax like this, when an alarm goes off with Sora declaring that's enough. The group instantly begins complaining about the sun, water, or sand, leaving Steph very confused as she apparently was the only person earnestly enjoying this vacation. If you enjoy this video and want me to make more, be sure to leave a comment letting me know. Later on around sunset, Sora gripes they've been waiting forever. Now Plum clearly told them the boat wouldn't be here until midnight, followed by Jibril appearing and confirming she's located Oceaned. He orders her to do it, she verifies if it's really okay, and Sora states the Covenant will prevent any harm. Jibril excitingly exclaims it's been so long, and the group nervously backs away as she weaves a massive spell. Using merely 5% of her power, Jibril splits the ocean well past the horizon, leaving Sora to pity the elves she once decimated. Our Flugel proclaims she's now seen Oceaned, and as such is able to shift them there directly. Everyone gathers together, Plum mutters something about a water breathing spell, but Jibril ignores her and teleports the group along with a massive air bubble. They're met with a spectacular underwater city, leaving Blank to wonder if Siren really isn't stupid after all, but Plum reveals the Dampier built all of this. Steph and Shrine Maiden complain their explosive entrance will surely be seen as a threat, though in reality they're peacefully approached. A certain fancy looking Siren wishes to communicate, but the air bubble makes that impossible. So to resolve this issue, Plum goes to drink some blood and returns a few moments later to cast a water breathing spell. This siren, named Amelia, is the stand-in ruler for the Sleeping Queen. She's definitely not the brightest, and she makes it very clear that she's willing to sleep with Sora any time. Being less than impressed, he just wants to be taken to the Queen, and Eno is amazed with Sora's self-restraint. The Sora bluntly declares that Amelia isn't even that attractive. While moving through the town, it's obvious the Dampier are depressed with their imminent extinction, yet the sirens seem perfectly happy. That's because the Sirens are not smart enough to realize the danger, followed by Sora wondering if half-breeds exist in this world. It's explained that Dampier and Siren intake other souls, but wholly changes them to match their own race. Jibro, however, is capable of bearing the child of another race, and is forcefully told to shut the F up by Shiro. Inside the royal chamber sits a block of ice with Queen Lorelei at its center. Our hosts leave to prepare the game, and the group is taken aback by her otherworldly beauty. Blank just isn't seeing the appeal, and Sora even proclaims Steph to be more attractive. Eno reassures him that impotence can be cured, and Jibro explains that Siren's high affinity with water spirits makes them unbelievably attractive while within the ocean. Sora and Shiro assume their lack of spirits makes them immune, but Jibro reassures them they must have spirits, they're just very unusual. Upon returning, Amelia and Plum ask the group to wager absolutely everything on this game. Steph is confused since they were asked to help, and Plum apologizes saying the commandments demand an equal wager. Sora doesn't seem to have an issue, but Steph exclaims this isn't right, prompting Amelia to reassure them she can just return all their possessions if they lose. Left with no other choice, Steph follows Blank's lead, but she still feels uneasy. After beginning the spell, Plum tells Sora to think up a setting for the game, and declares they'll win if the Queen awakens. Enveloped by a flash of light, they come to, drowning in the open ocean. A narrator is speaking over them as Shiro calmly accepts her incoming demise. Plum apologizes and quickly finishes the spell, constructing a pristine school all around them. Steph reaches out, seemingly touching something in the air, which Sora explains to be the game interface. Plum, not knowing they're from another world, is very curious as to how Sora thought up the setting. Now, Sora and Eno are wearing male uniforms, while Izuna, Jibril, and Shrine Maiden are all in female sailor suits. 
Steph demands to know why only she is in a male uniform, which is because the queen might swing that way. Plus, he needs a male friend in game who can gather information. A cutscene then plays with the queen beautifully and elegantly singing. The group is completely enthralled, except for Sora and Shiro. Day 1 officially begins with Plum explaining how the game works, including the heart-shaped button which activates the Dampier's love spell. Sora and the Shrine Maiden tell Gramps to show his skills, prompting him to ask if Sora was going to fake his love. That was Sora's plan, since this is all just a game. But Ino declares love to be all about confessing your true feelings, hence why Sora hasn't gotten any. Smashing the confess button, he sprints toward the queen, immediately complimenting her beauty. Instantly dropping to his knees with his face to the ground, he begs the queen to sleep with him. Everyone is shocked. The queen backs away, but Eno grabs her arm, refusing to give up. Thinking of Eno's 30 wives, Sora wonders if this is just what the werebeasts are into. However, the shrine maiden is just as disgusted as the rest of them. The queen does manage to escape, and Sora points out that technically, Eno didn't get rejected. Calling it quits for today, they meet up the next, where Steph hands over a pile of character information she's already collected. Sora is genuinely impressed, and Steph wonders if his affection rating may have went up for her, but she's swiftly drug away by a crowd of girls. On the third day, Plum asks why they're ignoring the queen, so Sora explains that it's best practice to raise your stats first when playing a dating sim. On the fourth day, our group goes on a date, and the fifth, Steph joins the student council. There's another group date on the 10th, excluding Steph, and around the 15th they realize they don't actually have to attend school. By the 20th, they're back at school due to boredom, and they hear a strange rumor about Sora having hurt Steph's feelings. He complains the game engine must be broken, and Plum exclaims they've totally forgot the reason they came here. The 40th morning, they arrive to school to find a barnacle-encrusted statue. The group can't deny his dedication, and Sora recognizes him to be the true embodiment of love. Unbelievably, the queen approaches Eno, causing him to slowly raise his head. Not a chance. Grinding his teeth, he reluctantly presses the cheat button and squeezes her chest. It's obvious the spell is super effective, yet she outright rejects his confession. Now stunned into silence, Sora boldly proclaims that Eno's love was much too good for her. He, however, recognizes it wasn't enough, as he slowly fades out of the game. Sora roars that the cheat spell was supposed to be an instant win, though Plum mutters the love spell can't make the impossible happen. Though there's no need to worry, since Amelia can simply give Eno his freedom. Anyways, Plum prompts them to continue the game. However, Sora's expression grows serious, and Shiro declares they've already won. Jibro and Shrine Maiden say they've had enough, followed by Jibro effortlessly dismantling the magic conjuring this game. Our hosts are very confused, so Blank explains they chose to save and quit since it wasn't against the rules. With an order, Jibra restores the air bubble, as the exhausted Shrine Maiden pulses red due to her blood break ability. It's revealed that she was reading their minds this whole time, and that this entire game is a big fake, as Amelia doesn't even want the Queen to awaken. Plus, she was lying about Sora being her type. Jibril does however confirm that the love spell activated properly, all the while Izuna and Steph are clueless as to what's happening. With another command, Sora orders them back to the beach, and Plum chooses to join them. Amelia threatens to harm Eno if they leave, but Sora dares her to lay a finger on him. Now sitting around a bonfire roasting fish, Steph demands an explanation. Apparently, Plum had been playing them from the start, even though Izuna confirmed she never lied. Sora explains the game's unusual setup, as they were forced to bet everything against the Queen, yet what do they get for winning? The Queen's love seems to be the reward, but for one, that's the win condition, and two, not an equal wager for their everything. Plum purposely waited until they were underwater to explain this, because she thought the Werebeast wouldn't be able to read their mind due to the water pressure. In reality, the Queen's game was a match with Dampier vs. Siren, where they bet on whether or not Team Sora would succeed. If they failed, Siren would thus own a manatee, giving them males to reproduce with. But if Team Sora won, Dampier would gain their freedom. Then if Team Sora, who wagered everything, managed to win, they'd be rewarded in kind, meaning they'd win everything Siren has. Blank had actually assumed most of this back in the Eastern Union, they just didn't have any evidence to prove it. So to reach this current situation, they went to the beach during the daytime in order to sap Plum's magic. Jibro and Shrine Maiden had their epic battle so they could find Oceane and test out Bloodbreak underwater. 
Then upon reaching Oceane, Plum had to leave to drink blood, giving Jibro a chance to prevent the water breathing spell from affecting the Shrine Maiden, thus allowing her to activate Blood Break and tell who was lying. Steph and Plum are at a loss for words, and Sora actually praises Plum's strategy, because whether they won or lost, Dampier would have been spared. However, there was one important point that Plum missed. Love isn't the condition to awaken the queen. She was being tricked by Amelia the entire time. Anyways, as things stand, Siren will end up devouring the last Dampier male, causing both races to go extinct. Their only realistic option for survival is to wholly surrender themselves to another race. Hence, why Blank will now win both races by doing absolutely nothing. Sora and Shiro then excuse themselves to use the restroom, and the Shrine Maiden tries to step away as well, but Steph brings up Eno. It's a fine bargain to sacrifice one man to gain two races, but Steph refuses to accept this. It's revealed that Eno lived his entire life for the good of the Eastern Union, and a crying, quivering Izuna confirms that Gramps was indeed content with this outcome. Though she's confused, because Sora once told her that nobody would have to suffer. Steph wonders if it's normal for the Eastern Union to make their children cry, but Shrine Maiden proclaims sacrifices to be part of life. Jibro declares it's unrealistic and even selfish to think otherwise, but Steph angrily refuses to accept this. Sora and Shiro return, to Steph declaring she's lost faith in them for sacrificing Eno. They're unsure why she's so upset, and simply say it's time to go save Gramps. I mean, how could they potentially pass up the opportunity to acquire two races? Not to mention the fact that Blank doesn't quit a game. Plum points out nobody knows how to wake the Queen, which Izuna verifies to be truthful. They recognize Lorelai's been asleep for 800 years, so they highly doubt anybody actually knows the key to waking her. That means the game is to figure out the rules of the game, and since it's not real life or real romance, Blank won't lose. Steph happily explains that she thought they would sacrifice Eno. They'd never do something to make Izuna sad, plus Sora would never abandon such a manly man. Besides, Amelia won't dare harm the hostage, because without him, Blank has no reason to resume the Queen's game. Izuna vows to trust Sora, and Jibril apologizes for purposely riling up Steph. Sora then confidently exclaims they'll actually be acquiring not two, but three races from this situation. A short ways away, the Shrine Maiden wonders if Blank knew that she was testing them, and she acknowledges that she really would have sacrificed Eno. She's beginning to think that she really can believe in them. Back at the group, Sora asks about the Queen's game, and Jibril's ashamed that some of her information was incorrect. He wants to know where she got said info, which turns out to be her homeland, Avantheim, followed by Sora proclaiming they need to gather more intel. Due to this, he orders Steph and Izuna to scour the King's Hidden Library, before turning to the rest, asking where they can find records of past games. Realizing the answer, Jibril shouts that at last, there will be a new Flugel Lord, and Plum screams that she'll go anywhere but there. Of course, that place is Avantheim, the homeland of the Flugels. By joining my Patreon, you can view these videos early, and get a massive shout-out like my seven newest patrons. Zura, Swish, Brayden Brown, Ronin13, Deleted, Fudgewaffle, and Black Reaper. Thank you guys and gals, I appreciate all of you.